and welcome back to another exciting episode of Rough Sketch to Final Draft. For Season 4, we thank you so much for being a subscriber and a follower and a longtime listener. If this is brand new to you, we love you and we thank you. I am Coach Adam, your host, and we are continuing Season 4 on deep dives about identity, about self-growth, and about personal understandings and peeling back those layers. And of course, in that whole entire sphere of that, sometimes it comes from society about where that actually does genuinely come from. And we are visited today by an incredible guest to actually help us unpack some of those elements of our world and our society about how we become who we are based on some of those things. And allow me now to introduce our amazing guest that we have for you today. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. And I like that you have the whole self-help thing going on because I always tell parents I specialize in homeschooling and education. But I always tell parents the best thing you can do for your kids you set an example of how to live a good life because ultimately they're going to learn a lot more from what they see than what you say. And I think we all intrinsically know this. We've all seen the father, the mother and father who are, are basically alcoholics. Everyone in the family is drunk all the time and they're yelling at their 12 year old, you need to stop drinking. Well, that's all they've seen their entire life. Of course, that's what they're going to be doing. So. The best thing we can do is live good lives and our children will just absorb that and it will become their culture, their way of life. Amen. Amen. Well said. And it's true the, the the fact of how we all get to where we are is kind of part and parcel to the fact of who our representatives in our lives were in that truest sense that these are the role models that we had and sometimes they shape us towards positive and towards the negative. So let's, um, Let's unpack that a little bit. What are some of the uh, cornerstones of what led you into doing what you're doing in this in this sphere that you're being such an amazing voice for and the fact that you're creating content that is so valuable in this world of today? What, what kind of got you started on that path, Brett? Yeah, well, I always loved history growing yeah. up. As anyone who's familiar with my social media, they know that I'm really into that. And I wanted to be a history teacher, probably because I didn't know what my options were in life. So I said, oh, I like history. I'll just teach that. <laughs> but when I got into the system, I didn't like what I saw at all. And I knew before I even had kids that there was no way I would ever send my kids to public school. I came through public school. Yeah. I had been in public school teaching. And I said, you know what? This isn't the right environment for children to grow up in, to be educated in. Yeah. So I knew I was going to do something else and my background was in education. So I just started um, offering to set up people's homeschools. I was mm. an educator and that kind of took off. That was really cool. Um, I don't know if I was ready for that, but it took off. And before you knew it, I was booked all the time and I was setting up people's homeschools, doing like these customized education plans. And one thing led to another. I really wanted to. As you start doing business, you learn about some of the problems you run into. And one of those yeah. with that model was scalability, mm. right? I only have so much time in the day. Right. So I formed a community, probably much like you have. I mm. formed my own community, but related in the homeschool field. And yeah. this way I could, members could join and then mm. I could basically teach them all at once. Yeah. And now I could serve many more people. It's a lot more scalable, right? Scalability. Yeah. Yeah. And as I did that, at first it was a community. I said, you know what? Screw it. I got the people in here. They're paying me. I'm just going to start building full curriculums for them. Why not? So I just started step by step building curriculums. It started out with a nature unit study. We did yeah. a full year gardening unit study and one class that I was teaching on uh, propaganda, using the Cubs to Bears books to teach children how to recognize mm. propaganda and manipulation. One thing led to another. Before you know it, I'm building out an entire curriculum. Now I'm hiring people. I'm able to pay people to actually come in and teach their area of expertise, which is great because, you know, people see someone like me on the internet and they say, he's very impressive. He knows everything. I don't. But what right. I could do is find people who are really good in this area. And that I have um, a guy who built a multi million dollar um, e commerce business. Yeah. And he just just finished. He just emailed me the final classes in it, but he did an intro to e-commerce course yeah. for the students. So now you have this guy with this great experience who built this great thing, right. and he's doing an intro to e-commerce, showing children, hey, there's 
you know, places like Shopify, Printify. Um, right. You could use Canva to make custom designs, T-shirts, whatever you want, and how to do this drop shipping so that they could be introduced to these concepts and could start doing it for themselves. Right. So one thing leads to another. And much like the way I built, that's kind of how I try to educate students. We have one girl. She's amazing. She wrote a book, A Farm, An Idea, and a Girl Named Kristen. Oh. It's a novel. You think pretty impressive, right? What do you mean a student? Yeah, she's 14 years old. She wrote a novel. It's okay. available on Amazon. Anyone who has a young child should get it because when your children read something like that and you say, your peer wrote this, yeah. it opens up something in their mind where they say, oh, wait a second. In fact, and that girl, so she did one thing led to another. Yeah. You know, she's opened up bank accounts. She's learning about marketing. She's reading books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And now, She's actually making a course for us where she's going to teach our other students how to become published authors. So it's just this idea that you could follow your interest and your passion and your children could do this and you can use it to kind of stack those skills, get that experience, develop that mindset, and you can watch your children and not wait until they go to college to discover who you really are. Yeah. They don't have to wait because they spend their whole life discovering who they really are. I love that. I love that. And we'll leave, we'll leave the link to that girl's book down in the description down below. I'll get that one from you. That's, <clears throat> that's too incredible. That's too, too incredible. So how does that feel? Because obviously, Brett, I'm amazed by you. And I think that anyone that comes to your content is, and I'm happy to share that with this audience amazingly and leave it on the internet forever, that I think the world of your content. How does that feel now that you've grown to this level and you're able to do that and help others at that metric in their life? How does that feel for you? It's funny because growing up, my father would always tell me that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that kind of sounds like a platitude, but I spent years in the rat race. Yeah. I did very well in the rat race, you know, for what they yeah. say success is, white picket fence, lived in one of the most affluent counties in the country, right? All of that. Felt like a slave. Yeah. Felt like a complete slave, hated working. <laughs> and now... I'm this entrepreneur and I, you know, I run my own business and I'm probably always working really like my wife would probably tell you, I'm just always working, but I feel like I'm never working. So yeah. it, it feels great. It's very rewarding. And one of the things I really try to use through my life experience is to drive that home to parents yeah. so that they could drive it home to their children. Like one of the things I'm really passionate about one of my projects right now is I've been building out this entire financial literacy curriculum for elementary school students. But my whole thing is learning through doing. So yeah. as they do this curriculum, we're guiding them to start their own lemonade stand. They're doing their own marketing. Yeah. And um, we're teaching them step by step to develop this mindset, to get the experience so that they're aware that there's a way outside of that rat race. And we can really um, educate our children with that philosophy of if we're going to prepare them to yeah. do something, then we have to let them do it, not just right. put them between concrete walls and say, hey, yeah. you know, when you're 24, 25 years old, you got that master's degree and $200,000 in debt. Well, maybe then just maybe, right. you know, they can start to do what they want to do. Go get a slugger. Yeah. At, at 28 years old. Yeah, you're right. With the debt behind. Well, I know that a lot of these passion projects are there. And so let's, for the sake of the audience, for those who obviously know your content and for all of the amazing Rough Sketch of Final Draft family who's going to love you and accept you and embrace you, what are some of the, the curriculums that you've already done? That one's exciting. What are some of the books that you've written right now that are already out there? Um, obviously, as we're recording this today, there's several books that are underneath your belt already. I tried to purchase the one to get it here on time. It's phenomenal. I just, I think the world of your work. So which, which ones do you already have right now? And let's kind of dive into those for the sake of the audience. Yeah. And this kind of really goes into, I like it because it's a good talk on anti-fragility. We yeah. learned during um, the events after 2020 mm. to protect your platform, but the events after 2020 yeah. with you. everything that happened, how they control people through financial leverage, right? Well, you need to work this job because you're in debt and you need to pay your mortgage. And if you don't do this thing that you don't want to do, but we want you to do, mm. well, then you're not going to be able to work that job, pay your mortgage, right? Mm. So. Yeah. I, I'm always trying to become more anti-fragile. Yeah, I kind of joke with people on social media. I'm like weeds. I just keep popping up everywhere. And I do that for every, preemptively. I don't wait for them to ax me. 
I'm yeah. preemptively popping up, popping up, popping up. I, like I was like, why do you have, is this a new account? Yes, of course it's a new account. Always. <laughs> so um, I started writing books a few years ago. My first book was Good Bears Always Tell the Truth. Yeah. That's now an Amazon number one best-selling book. My second book, um, The Right to Bear Arms on mm-hmm. the Second Amendment, another yeah. Amazon number one bestseller. Uh, yeah. The Bear from Jekyll Island, which is a tribute to one of the greatest historical books ever written. If anyone hasn't read it, um, The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. It's a tribute to that book, Mm. Um, but it's about the history of the banking system, Operation Mockingbird and the Church Committee, which is the congressionally documented history, historical fiction for kids Mm. about the congressional documented history of fake news. Yeah, This is important stuff that children should know. They should know that hey, you know, the CIA has been caught bribing media billions of dollars. That might be relevant to the news you grow up hearing. I have another book, Free Speech, Social Media Censorship, and the First Amendment, which follows the journey of Stand Up Bear. He's a comedian. He tells the truth. He gets banned. They call him anti-bird, right? All these things, you know, and they use that to take his platforms away. Um, I have The Peanut Trap, which is a bunch of pigs, how... Um, really how pigs are caught in the wild, but it's a great <laughs> allegory for how we get trapped where, you know, they offer them free peanuts and the pigs are going for them and free peanuts. And then one day those peanuts were inside a freshly constructed fence. Yeah. The pigs, they were kind of hooked on those free peanuts. They go in, slam. Now they're trapped. Good store, good message there. Yeah. We have, you are what you eat, which is where our food comes from. Our children have to know where their food comes from, which is why I make gardening lesson plans and unit studies and whatnot. Um, You are what you eat. And then you are what you eat. Part two, the GMO square down, Mm. which is about the corruption of the food system. And we introduce our newest villain, the science rat. And I think you guys will all appreciate what the science rat looks like when you see him. So I, I published all of these books and I think anyone could see who comes from a certain worldview, similar to mine, probably similar to yours, that why this stuff is important. But I was still beholden to Amazon. I was self-publishing through Amazon. And I know enough history, like Charles Lindbergh wrote a book about the Federal Reserve Bank in 1913, saying that this legislative act will be the greatest um, it will be the greatest legislative crime in the history of this country. Oh, dropping my dropping my light. <laughs> history of this country. And four years later, not only was his book banned, but the printing plates were destroyed. Yeah. You have Carol Quigley wrote this book, Tragedy and Hope. He talked about the banking powers. He named names. Not only was his book censored, but the printing plates were destroyed. Yeah. You go to 1989. This is a remarkable story. In my, this is one of the craziest stories that people don't talk about is Robert Maxwell, the billionaire father Mm. of Ghislaine Maxwell, who was Epstein's right-hand girl, right? Today, living and breathing today. Yeah, exactly. Right-hand girl of Epstein. Yeah. Right. Her father tried to purchase McGraw-Hill, the company in charge of making all American school textbooks. Right. Right. That's an alarming connection. Now, The purchase didn't go through because as they were in talks to finalize the purchase, Robert had an unfortunate accident where he fell off his billion dollar yacht, Mm. the Ghislaine, and he drowned. Um, There's a whole book you could read about that accident, which, you know, he was probably a spy for a country that you shall not name on social media. Otherwise, you get banned from everything. You know who I'm talking about. Well, right. They own our Congress and whatnot. Um, (laughs) So I'm aware of all of this and I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable with Amazon. I'm not anti-fragile. So for the last year, I worked behind the scenes and last week we became our own publishing company. We're publishing our own books. So they're all available at books.classicallearner.com. You could also just go to classicallearner.com and you'll click books and it will take you there. But we're actually publishing our own books operating as a publishing company i've now i took a book written in 1911 about george washington i love it these old books because they're not politically correct they say what they really thought so (laughs) this book in 1911 about george washington i turned it into an audiobook 
Okay. I have books about Andrew Jackson. Um, oh. I have the primary writings of historical figures currently being worked on by narrators. I'm turning them into audiobooks and bringing history. I call it the Restoring History Project. We're bringing history back to life. All available through our publishing company, books.classicallearner.com. Cool. And now it will allow me to start seeking out and partnering with other like-minded patriotic um, authors or maybe authors that get axed from other platforms, I could say, don't worry, you might have got kicked off of that platform. I can give you a home here. Yeah. We are taking control of the publishing aspect of that, becoming more anti-fragile. So that's what we have going on with the books. It started with me as an author. Now we're a publishing company, children's books, audio books, other authors, anti-fragility. And then, of course, I have the entire homeschool aspect of it. And in terms of, I mean, what we're making curriculum on, I have an entire course on critical thinking and discernment, which is probably my favorite course I ever taught. I wrote two fake newspapers, The Daily Cat <laughs> and The Bear Standard. Now, The Daily Cat, they're a little bit manipulative. Charisma Cat, she's our arch villain. The right. Bear Standard, the bears are kind of the good guys in our story. So yeah. I write these two newspapers and you can like see the dichotomy between them. But as we do that, we learn about sourcing, primary, secondary sourcing, source evaluation, and the logical fallacies. What is an ad hominem attack? What is an appeal to authority? What yeah. is an appeal to emotion, a straw man argument? So we're reading these newspapers, these fake papers. I have fake sources that I make, like primary sources, secondary sources. Every line the children are going through, they're critically analyzing it. Where did this information come from? They're going back to the source material. They're evaluating the source for themselves. And they're reading the articles and scanning them for logical fallacies. Is this an appeal to authority? Yeah. Then we have them fill out discernment charts. I know and how I know. I think I know and why I think that. I heard and where I can look. Hmm. So they're actually visualizing how they're filtering the information through their brains. I call this the development of intellectual self-defense. So these are the type of things we're doing. And it's revolutionary. It's groundbreaking. We're learning real civics. We're learning children are learning not only their rights, but how to actually use these systems. Like the, what is an affidavit? What is a conditional consent? Yeah. Right, where your employer comes up to you and says, Well, you need to, you know, wear this mask or whatever. And you show up to them with a piece of paper that yeah. says, I would be happy to wear this if. Yeah. Now you've presented them with a legal document and that's, and you can document <laughs> that you presented it. So now they're in quite a situation, right? Yeah. And these are the things that our children should know. And these are the things that I'm trying to bring to families all over the country. I agree. And I think, again, I'll never stop saying it. The work that you're doing is absolutely imperative at this point in time. And I think for anyone who's listening also from the Rough Sketch Final Draft family in the future, when you're finding this amazing information from Brett, is the fact that it might come up to the mind in anyone's perception and our awareness. There's always a yeah, but, or there's a yeah, or an if, or a but, or however that ends up playing in the mind. And I validate that of whether or not certain information is made for children or certain information is not. Children are immensely capable. Everyone in your own mind, close your eyes and go back to your own mind when you were young and all the things that you knew you were capable of, but the adults above you wouldn't let you maybe stay up late and watch the Johnny Carson show or stay up or read those books. Look, Hemingway had said it. Every book is a children's book so long as the child can read. And there's never too soon that a child can actually start to learn about its country and be able to defend its own rights, to understand its rights from a young fundamental age so that it actually learns to care about and preserve its own civic justice, its own civic duties, and know that those are rights. So that by the time they're 16, 17, 21, 22, 30 years old, they know their rights in and out. And we used to see that all the time in, in media, in all these movies, right? In the sense of like when someone would be arrested, like, I know my rights. That used to be a line that through the 80s, the 70s, and the 90s. We don't see that in movies, TV shows, books anything anymore. We never have anyone saying, I know my rights. Because again, the Carnegie Halls, the uh, McGrath and everything else like that have played into this wonderful manipulation, Klaus Schwab kind of World Economic Forum uh, scenario about the fact of just let the people be sheeple 
and let it go. And I'm, I'm going to circle back to what you'd said, because you, you shared so much goodness in that regard about the one with the pigs. Is it reminded me of Animal Farm? You made basically Animal Farm into a digestible kids version for the most part in a wonderful way to put that. And then that scene, if we want to actually talk to the parents and the hearts who are listening as well, in uh, Pinocchio, the animated one from the cartoon a long time ago, is when they went to the island and they turn into jackasses, right? Well, they, they don't come back as boys. In that regard, your book kind of ties that all in because it ties in the bow of what sometimes our rulers in that regard would like us to be, which is just kind of the puebs who are just going along with the, the play. And I love that you're undoing the matrix, good sir. So um, there's a lot there. So jump in with what you've got going on in your mind next. I can see your, your eyes are rolling. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I really like to do is study the childhoods of ultra creative or ultra successful people. And they're not always good people, but yeah. <laughs> you know that comes to morality. You got to teach your kids morality. But sure. I want to know what leads to great inventions, yeah. right? And um, Alexander Graham Bell, yeah. he was homeschooled and his parents had him creating and doing things with his hand. He was inventing things when he was 14 years old yeah. that farmers were adopting and it was making their lives immensely easier. He made uh, a tool that farmers used with wheat and it sped up their whole process by hours. And this is a 14 year old kid. And of course, then he goes on to invent the telephone, which yeah. would change the entire world. I mean, talk about inventions that change the world. That's a really big one. Yeah. Another one, inventions that change the world. Henry Ford. There we go. And he grew up on a farm. He grew up trying to solve problems. His dad was a farmer and he had him out in the field. And he always tried to make things more efficient as a kid and with his dad because that would make his life easier. And really interesting, his dad wound up attending a World Fair event when yeah. Ford was a kid. And at that event, someone showed him a model of an engine. Mm. Of course, at that time, like, what is an engine? Well, that's what Henry Ford's dad saw. And yeah. he came home and he took that knowledge and he told his son, yeah, there's this thing called the engine. Right. And he actually created an environment where his son could start working with mechanical things. And when Henry Ford was 14 years old, yeah. he had actually fully taken apart and reassembled a watch. Mm. And it wasn't long after that, that yeah. he was revolutionizing the world with what? engines because his dad learned <laughs> something allowed him to work on it and solve problems and yeah. then look what he became yeah. and i think all of us as parents could take a lesson from that and say you know what maybe instead of throwing out that old printer i was about to throw out mm. maybe i should put it on the kitchen table and say your assignment this week is to take this thing apart yeah. and put it back together mm. i like that I like that. I like that. And see where it goes. See, where, see it goes. where it goes. Maybe when they put it back together, they see the flaws and they, they re-engineer something and they become someone down the road that creates some sort of new patch that makes it better. I see where you're going with that. I like that. And, and just the confidence in that. Oh. I was just looking at a 75-year Harvard study, which found children or adults who did chores as children when they were three, four years old. Hmm. were much more successful and happier as adults. I and mean, I was looking into other studies about that and what they found pretty consistently hmm. is children who did chores or their parents allowed them to solve problems yeah. would actually develop confidence in themselves and self-esteem. Because it's one thing to tell a child you're great, which you should. Right. It's another thing when there's a problem in front of them, yeah. they look at it, and they solve and overcome that problem. Now, they don't really need you to tell them how smart they are because that clicks in their mind. They say, wow, look what I solved. I, I can solve other problems. I'm really yeah. smart. Right. They actually demonstrate it to themselves. And it's the parent's job. As we're all listening, we all love our, our parents we might have had, though obviously now the accountability is on us, fam. In that regard, to create and cultivate that culture inside of our own homes, right? Just because it wasn't done for us maybe in the past, it isn't at all not on our shoulders to make that environment now moving forward for ourselves and our families and it's hard you know your child's trying to get dressed and they're taking forever yeah. and you have somewhere to be <laughs> but sometimes the best thing you could do is just step back and say i'm gonna wait 20 minutes 
for them to get this shirt on. Mm. And when they do, now they overcame that obstacle. And now, maybe subconsciously, but that registers self-esteem, right? It, like it starts to build. Like, yes, I did get this shirt on. Uh -huh. That's right. Right? Yeah. right. Real confidence is competence. That's the underlying submodality root of all of that, down to NLP and everything else like that. It's, it's the competence that we have that breeds and fosters forward that confidence. So also with that as well, uh, you had mentioned it at the very beginning, and that's incredible. Um, you've got little ones. How many do you have? You got like a whole entire gaggle? You got you got a football team? How many, how many little ones do you have, sir? A uh, six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-month-old. Ah, God bless you. Just God bless you. So I would, because it's, it's part and parcel to the segue of the next question that sent to me, just blessings to you, my friend. In this world of today, in the sense of having a family, um, what do you have to say about that for other families out there who are maybe thinking about not having a family? I think that's a crucial question that is not necessarily asked enough from amazing, influential, inspiring minds such as yourself. What do you have to say for individuals out there who are thinking, now isn't the time, the world's going to end, don't have kids, so on and so forth. Here you are. You're amazing. You're doing it. You have an amazing family. What have you got to say about that? I remember about six, seven years ago, <laughs> I was at my grandmother's house. Yeah. And she was on hospice. She was laying in her bed at 95 years old, about to die. They told her that you could get a heart surgery, but she decided I'm 95 years old. And she was one of those people that she was like up until two weeks before she died, just walking around, zipping around town at 95 years old. She still had her wits about her. So she was 95. They said, yeah, you know, it looks like your heart is going, but we could do a surgery. She said, I've lived perfectly healthy for 95 years. If my body goes and I'm just, I'm going to let it go. She had, yeah. she had lived such a great life. God. And we all spent the week there, the whole family. And I mean, she was there with her children and all her grandchildren and great grandchildren just running all around the house as she's laying in that bed yeah. waiting to die. And she was such a happy, content woman. Like there was no fear in her. There was yeah. no, she wasn't upset at all. She was so filled with joy. Yeah. Because her life, everything she had built, this empire yeah. that she had built as the matriarch of this family, her entire life was love and belonging and purpose. There was nothing to be upset about. Yeah. And I compare that to other people who die alone without a family around them and to think, they missed the best part of life. The best part of life isn't going to bars. The best part of life isn't that yeah. experience. It's the experience of the love building around you. That's the best part of life. And the system tries to sell young people something different that you yeah. want to put that off. Or if you're a woman, you know, you don't, you don't want a, a, a husband who's going to oppress you. What you really need is a, a corporate boss because they're looking out for you. Yeah. I mean, you, you've worked in the corporate world. I can tell you firsthand, they're not, they don't care about you, right? They do not. <laughs> they do not, yeah. So to me, you know, you could have all the experience and all the money in the world, but when you're an old man or an old woman dying in your bed, yeah. if you want to go out content and happy and with no fear, then you want to see the empire you built around you of love. And that, mm. that comes from family. I love that. I really, really do. I appreciate you, Brent. I, the way you were saying it too, I was thinking about that quote from uh, from Braveheart. Many years, many dying, years from now, would you look back and go back? And the answer is yes. We would. We'd go back to redo it and live our twenty, relive our twenties, relive our thirties, whatever we're in now, whatever stage we're in. We're thinking, oh, we're not enough. We're not this. We have these limiting beliefs. In the future, we'd give anything to be able to come back right to today with all the ailments, all the issues, all the stuff that we have today to be able to be where we are. And I'm just, I'm grateful for individuals such as you out there inspiring the messages because I think the, uh, I'm going to say it this way, obviously in the, in the safe space of the isms of the world that are being thrown around and they're being kind of force fed to us in a Orwellian kind of manner. It's just undoing the whole entire fabric of society in such a harmful, almost too clear to not be able to see. So there's very many individuals out there in the world who don't see this still to this very 
day. And I'm wondering that that has to be some sort of like black mirror where it's, it's a deliberate, they're not trying to see it, right? Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. We have a blinders on. And then there really is just this, you're focused on it though. You're, you're, you're purposely not trying to look. You buried your head in the sand and you're not gonna. And these isms are just undoing the whole entire fabric of society. So again, it's one of the reasons I love what you're doing is because you're actually helping understand where we all come from, what our purpose in society is, and what our actual country is it, from its onset of not being this evil, tyrannical thing that the news tells us that it is every day, but re-reminding us as Americans of what our country stands for, what we really are, and the gift that we actually have to be in this amazing country, perhaps before we lose it. So, Yeah, and the best thing we can do is for ourselves and for our country yeah. is to take agency over our own lives. Amen. So years back when they locked everything down mm. and I saw what was going on in the world, I said that I hadn't taken enough responsibility over my own life. And yeah. I looked my wife in the eyes and I said, it's time to sell the house. Let's mm. go do something amazing. And we sold the house and we moved down south. We bought land in the middle of a forest. Yeah. And I knocked down the trees and cultivated the land and put up this house. And now we have a garden and an orchard and we raise our own laying hens. We raise our own meat birds wow. and we take immense personal responsibility over everything in our lives. And by doing that, every day becomes more fulfilling. And by do that, you become more comfortable and you feel like you have more power over your life to the point where you stop looking outward and saying, oh, when are these politicians going to solve our problems? Yeah. And you start realizing that you could solve those problems. And then one day you wake up and you've written a child, a children's book. And the next day you wake up and you've started a homeschooling company. And the next day you wake up and you have a publishing company and you're publishing audiobooks and you're bringing out authors. And hmm. 12 months from now, or 12 to 24 months from now, yeah. I will have knocked down trees that I have on the main road of my property. And we're going to actually put up a physical storefront and we're oh. going to partner with local farmers, local craftsmen, local businesses in the area, local creators. Yeah. And we're going to sell their products right out of our storefront. Yeah. And when you do that, you realize that the politicians aren't, they don't have to save you because what you can do is start building up yourself and building up the networks around you, the supply chains around you, where now that local farmer has an outlet to sell his stuff. That local clothing designer has an outlet to sell their stuff. And you're forming these connections, these supply chains. You become strong without anyone else having to do it for you. Mm. I love it. I, I'm going to jump right into it because we're, we're in it. So let's, let's keep this train of thought going. You're obviously someone who did what you've done and it's incredible and nothing's going to stop you. Obviously, there was a part in time before this, as you had said, that there was a moment, there was a, a transformation, a genesis of a spot, and now here you are. In a coaching S type of way, we kind of come about this sometimes from a breakdown to a breakthrough. If there's individuals, right, that are going through this spot where they have self-doubt and limiting beliefs on the idea about what they really want to go after and achieve, what do you have to tell them as advice on what to do to quiet that voice in the back of their mind to just jump in and do it? Well, what I would say is if you asked me to climb a mountain and I looked at the top, it would be pretty damn intimidating. Yeah. But when you realize that if you're going to climb that mountain, you just have to take one step. Yeah. And then after I take one step, I'll take another one and another. And each step is pretty small. Mm. I might stop and have some water, but I'm going to work my way up that mountain. I'm going to work my ass off. Yeah. And for me, when I started building my company and my business at first, it was just an hour a night where I committed to, I'm going to work for one hour a night where I, I'm going to turn the TV off and I'm going to spend an hour trying to build something. I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And some nights I would sit there for an hour and think, and people would say, well, that's not productive. That's not successful. Well, that's one hour I needed to think. True. It's one hour less of thinking that ultimately I'll have to do. <laughs> and by making that small commitment, that baby step, you start to build something. And before you know it, because once you start, once you get going, yeah. that one hour would become four, five, 
I'd wake up four or five in the morning. I'd still be going because that just you start and you keep going. You're into it. You're passionate. Mm. And um, that's what I would suggest that, you know, you don't, right. If you wanted to be a great basketball player and you look at Kobe Bryant, sure. you say, oh, you know, or LeBron James. Well, how can I be Kobe Bryant or LeBron? Well, you're not going to be tomorrow. Yeah. But if you work really hard every day consistently, you're going to get pretty damn good. Yeah. There we go. Rome wasn't built in a day, but you bet your sweet. <laughs> they were laying bricks every night. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. precisely. Absolutely. Well, let's um let's do this too. Obviously, in the, in the sense of as as things are moving, obviously you've got a lot of things going. You've got a lot of moving parts. I'm amazed at every single time I get a chance to interview these incredible guests. And again, thank you. I'm honored to have you as this guest. Fam, don't forget to like and subscribe as well. I have to keep on reminding myself to say that throughout the course of these episodes. Um, I'm just amazed by what you're doing. I, I only knew a portion of it and what you're doing is absolutely incredible and even more inspiring than I would have known. What are some of the more things that are the future up to comes with that? You've got the storefront and so on and so forth. You just mentioned that what else is coming down the pipeline that we can be excited about that. Obviously this episode will be here from now until kingdom come. So what else is coming that we can be excited about that we can root Brett on for writing more children's books, okay. bringing on authors, yeah. publishing more audiobooks. Good. building out our curriculum and every day we build more. I mean, if you're listening to this two years from now, we'll have all so many more courses than <laughs> we do now. Yeah. Developing the homestead, Love it. building out our garden more, building out our orchard more next spring. I plan on getting honeybees, something I'm really excited about and producing wow. our own honey, okay. getting the storefront going. That's good. One thing leads to another and yeah. There, there are a lot of things that I kind of have in that I keep close to the vest right now, okay. right now. But um, once you get going, one thing leads to another and opportunities start to present themselves. Hmm. And when I look up 20, 30, 40 years from now, hmm. I see media companies. Good. I see um, entertainment venues. I mean, there's so much that I want to do. I always walk before I run because no matter someone might look at me and say, oh, well, you know, look at you climbing the mountain. Well, there's always much bigger mountains. And I could look at those mountains and say, well, how can I compete with Walt Disney? Well, right. today I can't. But yeah. I'm just going to take one step, two steps, three. And what does that look like after 40 years? Right. And it's the same concept of someone who maybe right now they have nothing going on in their lives. When yeah. you look at someone like me and say, well, well, how do I get to that with one step? And I would look at Walt Disney and say, well, how do I get to that? Because we sure need something like that that's not filled with woke nonsense. And mm. hey, man. it's up to us to do it. We can't just complain our way out of things. we got to do things. No, no. The, the, the complainer in the room is winning. It's, it's not the one who's going to get the done job going no i agree and and brett we're we're believers here so i know that this family is going to embrace you good sir as i have and i'm going to wrap this up with a pretty bow because we've gone through a journey of who you are the life-changing materials you're creating for children the children's books the future of what we're talking about um we've gone a merry-go-round throughout portions of history as well and just kind of touched on those keystone areas this is a moment that i always like to send back to my amazing guests and allow you to basically we can chase rabbit holes we can keep going but it really is a spot where if there was something that was on your heart that you wanted to have as the message for today, for anybody to listen to this one in the future and so on and so forth, what would be that message that you want to be able to give to people today that is on your heart to be able to share, my friend? What is that? That our only limitations are the limitations we put on ourselves in our mind. Hmm. And when you see a goal, you could achieve it. You just have to work toward it. And the one thing we don't want to do, and I really stress this to parents all the time, is yeah. we don't want to put the limitations of our mind mm -hmm. on our children. We don't want to shackle our children down yeah. with what we didn't think was possible because I have seen firsthand what is possible. And yeah. the students that are coming through classical learner and children all over the, the world that aren't through classical learner, but there yeah. are young people who are going to do greater things than I have ever done greater things than most people have ever done. And they're just coming up now. The yeah. only limitations we have are in our mind. Mm. 
couldn't be said better and I couldn't agree more. And the fact of, of how we set them up for either success or limitation really is an accountability on us all in our society. Because if we see someone in the political world doing what it's doing, and then from the citizen level, we adhere to that and then pass that on to the next generation. We are doing our part. These guys can do what they want to do, but we need to always be accountable for this part. I love that. Well, that's the thing. The other, the other part of it is that they respond to leverage. So people say, oh, well, the politicians, they don't listen to us. Well, everyone's in debt. No one grows their own food. People don't own businesses. They're like completely dependent on whether it be government or corporations. And when you're dependent, you don't really have a lot of power. You don't have a lot of leverage. And then the politicians are getting leveraged by all of this big money that has power. So the sure. only way to counteract that is to start building those supply chains I talked about where you start a business and you hire like-minded people. Right. And now next time when the government comes along and they do the whole thing and you know you need to work that job or get that procedure, well, no, you don't because you work for me. Yeah. And I'm not going to make you do that. Right. So you start to get leverage. You start to get stronger and you extrapolate that out, whether it's an online business or a storefront or whatever it might be, your whatever your area is, right? Everyone has their area where they know right. things. But you extrapolate that out and people start to get stronger on a whole. Well, I think what you would see is the government actually has to start capitulating to that. An example would be homeschooling itself, right? Mm -hmm. Where when the school system has no competition, they can just get crazier and crazier and crazier. But when the, there starts to be an alternative and people are pulling their kids out and going in a different direction, eventually they have to respond to that. Yeah. And they, at the very least, they have to pretend that they're responding to that in a way that makes people happy. So right. yeah. leverage is key to getting the political class to do you know, what we want them to do. Amen. Well, while avoiding the Hegelian dialectic of problem resolution that they create and then they come in the vanguard being like, hey, we're here to save you from the problem that we just created five years ago, 10 years ago, 10 days ago, and acting as though we weren't a part of that, you know, desert storm, da -da -da. what just got done happening in the world where we were in, um, uh, let's just say, forced um, capitulations in that regard. Our education system is lower than it's ever been. Our health rates are dropping everywhere. Our longevity rates of living is lower than it's ever been. Birth rates are lower. Sperm counts down. Education is just bottom of the rung in every single category. Our food is poisoned. Our air is poisoned. Our water is poisoned. Something's got to change. Eventually, like I said before, just you know, circling back to our conversation maybe 10 minutes ago, people are deliberately putting their head in the sand. There's no way that they can miss this stuff. It doesn't even matter about that word conspiracy that they've said out there which is a CIA term that they used to weaponize against the people in the first place and the whole entire thing. That was fantastic, right? During the McCarthy trials. But at the same time, the fact of like, there, people have to be seeing that this is taking place and something's got to give, something's got to change. Yeah, they see it. And I think people are, it's kind of cool because you always hear people say things like, this is the age of the awakening. Well, what really excites me is the children of the age of the awakening, mm. because what we had to wake up to, we can teach to our kids from the beginning and they're going to be a very difficult generation to trick yeah. and control. Amen. Let's go. Brett, you're amazing. You're an absolute inspiration and I'll never stop saying it. I think the world of you, my friend, I'm grateful to have you as a guest on this amazing show. And on this episode, I will treasure it always fam. Brett, tell, tell them where you can be found. Let, let the people know. I know you have the website and the Instagram. Give, give them the whole entire thing. We'll put the links down below, but if they're listening to it, just uh, allow them to be able to hear it. Yeah, you can find all of my stuff at classicallearner.com. That's classicallearner.com. You'll see the homeschooling, the books, everything we have going on. And on Instagram, I am classical learner. That's my more homeschooly type stuff. Okay. And then I also have Cubs to Bears books, which is pure historical gravy. It's so a little good. bit more exciting on that type of stuff. So, um, you know, whatever you're more into. And then I'm on TikTok. I'm um, at Real Brett Pike. I'm Cubs to Bears. I'm, um, I don't know. I'm a couple different things on TikTok. Uh, YouTube, Classical Learner. 
Um, Twitter, I'm classic learner because someone had classical. So I am classic learner on Twitter and uh, classical learner on Gab. So you pretty much know how to find me. Just classical learner. There we go. If they put your name in Google, you're going to pop up everywhere. So fam, go find this amazing human soul. And Brett, thank you again for being an amazing guest on this episode. All right. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Awesome. Preach at all times, but if necessary, use words. Mm. Mm. I love that. Preach at all times, and if necessary, use words. Mm. Thank you. What's on my heart is what's in my heart, which is just... Emotional sense and in a uh, professional sense. I would say the first thing is professional. I'll talk to that. Mm. I think one of the 